Yes, but yes, it, it is that it's it's fully deciding that rather than be at the mercy of your memories, just that you're going to take charge of them. In, in other words, you're going to have memories. You're going to make memories. You're going to get in the positive frame of mind and then remember being in the positive frame of mind. And it seems like if you don't, if you don't take charge, if you don't have, take charge of your memories, then your memories will take charge of you. Yeah, yeah. Which is not good if you if if what running round and round is a negative memory. Yeah, that's why I think it. You know, that's why I kind of had this idea. I thought, well, people really knew a little bit more about how memories are made and how they're tied to our feelings and our thoughts. Then they they would take more control over them. Mm. Yes, and as you say, there is that moment of time. What was it you said that there's there is thinking, and then the the memory and the feeling mm -hmm. each of those takes time and so then you turn the sentence around and say so there is time to do something yeah there is time and you you you, you, you there's a quote quite later on in the book from a, a a a single mother i think it was a homeless mother who was very depressed and i think the quote was that she said when she'd begun to do your program you know that she'd never thought about having a thought they just happened. Yeah. But your, you, what you'd been suggesting had, had made her focus in on that moment when it was happening so that you could see the negative thought rising up and do something about it. Yeah. Yeah, she said, I, I used to have thoughts or I had thoughts and I would just act on them. I never thought about a thought <laughs> as if I had no, yeah, no choice really. Because again, you know, they do seem real. They do seem like you have to act on them, but but you don't. Yeah. And you also told the lovely, well, it's a, a story about your father mm. and, and, and what your mother did to help him. Would, I mean, you've written about it, so I, I presume you wouldn't mind telling us briefly. No, I don't mind. Thank you. Um, my dad would probably like it in a way. He, uh, my dad was, um, my dad was kind of, I, I, I guess at the time when he was, when I was young, I wouldn't have necessarily called him depressed, um, but he was a, like an, a terribly exuberant person, but he had a good life, um, but he retired early, although he was in his 60s, so it doesn't seem that old now, but at the time he seemed very old, <laughs> and um he had a really busy career. He was an engineer. He liked work. He hardly ever took vacations. And so I came home from college and he had retired and he was just sitting in his chair like all day long with his head in his hands. And um, I mean, I just never had seen him like this. And my mother was very, you know, worried because she thought he might do something drastic. And he'd had a bad childhood his father had committed suicide so uh which he didn't really talk about you know I think he came from that older generation the war generation the depression generation so he didn't really talk much about about his father committing suicide and how he found that didn't it. mean the memory wasn't there though oh yeah I'm sure he thought about it a lot and it might have even contributed a bit to to his depression I would think um but yeah my mother uh rather than just, you know, sitting around, letting it get worse and, you know, who knows what could have happened. She was like, okay, we're going to move to California. Um, I was out there and my brother was out there. They rented a place on the beach uh, where they could, my dad could go down there and do some fishing. And I think she just knew, like she had, to, had to do something. And he also probably knew too you know, that that would help him. So it was a really good example of, you know, of providing an enriched environment, like kind of forcing, right, forcing him out of this kind of cycle where he was just doing nothing, but, you know, lamenting the fact that he retired. And yeah, he, he had, I mean, he was, he was never going to be like, you know, super no, but, jolly but, guy, but he definitely got pretty happy or better anyway.
But I mean, that's a, the, the story of your, your father is, is, is quite a common one. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those cliches that um, you had a lot of depression in, in uh, I suppose it would have been men in the past, but now it must be men and women who've had a busy life. And suddenly at 65, the boss says, well, goodbye. You give them a little gold clock and then they stop. And they're just left with whatever was in the past. And, yeah. And, and it is a serious mental health problem, certainly has been amongst men. And I, it, it must now be amongst women because they've gone through that same, you know, having been doing all that work and then suddenly, you know, you're chucked out. Yeah, and haven't really, you know, he didn't have hobbies. He wasn't a super social person. So he didn't have all those outlets that maybe other people would have had. Um, you know, I've been thinking a lot with the pandemic and so many people retiring kind of, abruptly and you know in this mo in a moment of haste or maybe maybe you know some suffering for sure but you know I wonder sometimes how that's going to play out if people are are really going to be satisfied you know in that in that new world that doesn't involve work and uh yeah. I'm sure it's variable but um it's, it's, I'm sure it's kind of good and bad. I, I feel like, you know, the pandemic too made a lot of people kind of face their own mortality and maybe think, well, is, is there something else, you know, that I, that I could be doing mm -hmm. that would be more stimulating and more exciting. And that's not bad to, to go through that process. No, indeed. Um, do you mind if we, if we take some questions, because there's a lot of them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, Stella O'Brien says the discussion section about managing memories is this akin to actively curating memories and doing it to improve our overall health without creating false memories um not necessarily you know one of the things that I I, I did try to get across in the book was that there's no like one approach right there's no one skill i'm not trying to say um we should suppress our memories nor nor do i think we should you know go over them uh repetitively or change try to change them but rather just become more aware of them mm -hmm. it's almost like you could see them from the outside you know kind of step out of them like you would have thought too mm -hmm. And just kind of step out and then watch them. But don't necessarily try to, to change them. Yeah, but you've got, they're not just, there's some distance between you and them. So you've got some kind of agency. You can, it's like a picture in a book. It's not you, you're not in it. You can, you can look at it. Exactly. Okay. Um, um, Sanjay asks, how do you deal or manage the bereavement of a parent, especially when it's been weighing you down for a while? Um, this, this person feels that, you know, it's, it's caused him to have panic attacks he's never had before. So the, uh, I suppose bereavement certainly must count as a trauma. It does. It does. In fact, it, it wasn't, you know, as recognized as it is now, you know, within in the clinical field of psychology, how how traumatic it can be. And I'm sure, oh my gosh, you know, how many people are are having a lot of problems now if they lost someone from, due to COVID. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that, that I, I actually had it in, in the book and then I, I ended up taking it out for various reasons, but when my, my mother died, um, I had a really strong memory of her the day she died in the hospital. And I couldn't get that memory out of my head. Like I just couldn't, like no matter what I did, anywhere I went for months really uh, after that, that memory would come up. And now it's been like 10 years and I still have it. You know, I still have that memory of that day, but the other memories of her that I have like throughout my whole life have like come up again, right? They're all like interwove 
interwoven with this other memory. And so I can't really access that memory as much as I used to be able to. And mm -hmm. so I guess one thing I would say is like, with time, I don't think time heals all wounds because it doesn't necessarily, but it does fade. You know, the, the, the intensity of that memory and particularly the association with the feeling. Like, so for example, now, if I, ha if I bring up that memory of my mother, it used to go right to the feeling and I would cry. But now I can kind of stop it. Like even now talking to you, I can kind of, I can see it would go there <laughs> and uh, I'm not gonna let it because I don't need to. Mm -hmm. And I, ha I have some like distance from it. I don't know if that helps, but I, I do think, you know, knowing that it will get better with time, even though I know people tell you this, but there's a, there's a physiological reason why it gets better with time because the other memories, you know, come back yeah. into conscious awareness. Um, Pat Dale asks, how do you support a person who has eating disorder? It's a very big question. Do you think your, your um, mental training would help someone with an eating disorder or would help the person who's helping them? Um, I don't really know. You know, we've done quite a few clinical studies with this program and I haven't ever conducted a study. So I kind of always hesitate to say for sure. Um, but on the other hand, I think it could help just about anyone. Hmm. And, you know, because eating disorders are oftentimes fueled by anxiety, you know, they have a lot of anxiety inherent in them. I do think it, it could help, hmm. but I, I don't have any data. There's an interesting question from um, Vicki Jackson, who says, she, she makes the point that um, some people have events which they experience as traumatic, even though others would say, oh, no, that's not traumatic. Um, do you agree that just because someone else says, oh, that's not traumatic, that if it feels traumatic to you that, that it is, or how do you deal with that? Yes, I totally agree. In fact, I hope I made that clear early on when we were talking, but if I didn't, I meant to, is that it's really the response to the event, right? It's the response that matters, not the actual event. You know, and there's so many examples of this. I mean, people are exposed to all kinds of uh, experiences and one responds one way and another responds the other. I, I opened the book with the story of this couple who was in a terrifying car wreck. And they were a married couple and they both had to watch somebody, a child die in front of them. And so they were both quite traumatized, but they responded very differently. And the, and the man was able to break the windshield and, and get his wife and him out of the car. And, but later, you know, she really had a lot of trauma, a lot of trauma symptoms, PTSD that, that was lingering, whereas he was, you know, able to recover. So that was a, like an example of like two people exposed to the same experience, but the responses were, were quite different. So yes, it's, it's the response that matters. And it gets back to what you were saying about control, that, that if you feel that there's no response you can make, that you have no ability, then that, that, that itself is debilitating. Whereas you know, what you're suggesting in this program is here is something you can do to take some control. Yeah, yeah. Lear like learn that you have some control. Um, a, a couple of people have um, raised the question, if it's bad to ruminate when it's negative thoughts, is it good to ruminate on positive ones or is just rumination a bad idea whether it's good? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, in a very general sense, the word ruminate could be about positive things. It just so happens that most people don't ruminate yeah. on positive as much as they do the negative. So in, a, in, a, in clinical psychology, rumination is generally considered negative. Hmm. But yeah, if you could, it's not then a rumination in a way if you're kind of forcing yourself because mm. a rumination is more it's almost involuntary it's, it's just a habit it's just mm. going around and around um and presumably from what you said even if you could ruminate on a positive thought that's still not as good as 
making new thoughts exactly new, new memories positive yeah. genuinely originally new ones not just recycling an old one yeah i mean one of the things i, I kind of touched on a bit at the end is that there's different tricks mental skills that you can learn you know one would be to replace a negative thought with a positive one uh, another would be to try to suppress a memory or a feeling. Another would be to uh, just let it go. And then these are all skills that have been around really for thousands of years. You know, mm -hmm. people have been, been practicing them in one way or another in meditation circles, but also, of course, in, in modern psychology. And they're all kind of similar. You know, they're all kind of based on this basic premise that you can be aware of your own thoughts and memories, and you can manipulate them to some extent. And so I guess what I, I would say is that there's no magic pill or magic potion. It's really like learn as many of these skills as you possibly can. Hmm. And then when the moment arises, you could use them. You could say, well, okay, now I'm going to replace that negative thought with a positive one. But maybe the situation would be such that you just wouldn't want to bring up the feeling, like I said earlier about my mm. mother. Um, so it's more about being uh, aware of this moment, enough so, with enough information, enough skill, that you can kind of choose what you're going to do. Mm. It's an, okay. It's another interesting um, question, that some an anonymous question. Um, says, how do you help support awareness of someone who sees their difficulties only as a set of physical symptoms that need to be fixed? And have, they've never talked about their feelings. So in other words, they, they don't see it as, as a question of memories or of, dis, of rumination, but they're, they're convinced that their problem is just physical. How, would you, how do you deal with that? How do you begin to get that person to think that's maybe not just a physical thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that is hard, I have to say. You know, one of the things I, I actually teach about mental illness uh, at the university, and so just the other day I was talking about diagnosis hmm. and of mental illnesses. And, and one of the things that you have to, to do as a clinician is rule out a physical basis. And that sounds easy. Right? You have to say, well, this can't be due to some kind of medication you're taking or some kind of disease that you might have. Um, but in practice, it's, it's virtually impossible, right? Because you, you couldn't rule out every possible <laughs> physical ailment. And, and not only that, it kind of brings back this idea that, that psychology is, is separate from our biology, hmm. which it isn't. So, I mean, I don't have the answer to that. I do think that becoming more aware of memories and thoughts and that they are physical they're just as physical as you know what's going on in your liver or your kidney it's just that they're going on in in your brain and that's that's okay doesn't make them less important doesn't make them more important it just makes it part of your body part of the system yes. that keeps us but alive and, but allied to that is realizing that they're not passive things in themselves, that memories aren't just like, they're, they're, they, they can have an effect on you. And yes. therefore, you need to sometimes try and have an effect on them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Tracy, they're not elusive. They're, they're real in the sense that they're, they're made, yeah, they're made by elements right elements in your body elements in the universe that create these experiences they're not they're not supernatural i think sometimes people have a feeling that like memories and thoughts and psychology in general is like somehow supernatural it's not it's really hard to explain <laughs> <laughs> and to understand but it's not supernatural right and if it's not supernatural then it's natural and if it's natural You've got the chance of being able to do something about it yeah um on that hopeful note i'm afraid we have to stop there it's been it's been lovely talking to you thank you um thank you. and um in, in case people want to 
that's the book. And it does have a very practical guide in it. Um, Tracy, it's been great. Thank you very much for chatting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. You.